All right, welcome. Welcome another Thursday. Welcome to the Root Cause Healing Radio Show. <laughs> Still get a kick saying that. I love saying Root Cause Radio Show. All right, everybody. So uh, thanks for being here. Uh, remember, this is a live Facebook group. And so uh, uh, we would love to uh, receive your questions right, and answer the questions that are most pressing to you. Um, if you're not viewing this live if you're watching it as a recording uh certainly you know type your questions into the facebook group and we will do our best to answer it there so for all of you that are live welcome um so what are we talking about today the coronavirus yeah we're still getting a lot of questions yeah 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 i yeah so just on the regarding the coronavirus regarding the vaccine uh Again, if you have not watched the 90-minute uh, webinar that I did on the vaccine, you can go back and, and watch that. Um, it's really chock full of information. Uh, many people have called me, even recently, who were skeptical, did watch the, uh, the webinar and were grateful. Uh, they made the decision to get the vaccination. Um, you know, let me tell you a couple of quick short stories, which is it's just yesterday, as a matter of fact, I was speaking to a young gentleman um, who reached out to me for care. Uh, he's young, he's 30 years old, um, and he informed me that his dad, uh, who is 57 years old and a very healthy guy, exercises, eats right, uh, he passed from COVID. He passed from COVID a year ago, April, so when it was first kind of hitting. Um, he and his dad and another partner are in the business together. They are actually in the restaurant supply business, so you can imagine how they are affected that also, but it's been a devastating year for him. You know, so I know that a lot of people who have not been personally affected by it may poo-poo this a little bit, but you know, people who have been directly impacted has really changed their lives dramatically. Um, that that being said, you know, uh, it's interesting that I personally have been trying to get vaccinated and uh, have had my difficulties in getting vaccinated. Um, I'm going. I'm supposed to get together with some college friends uh, in about a few weeks from now. Um, about eight of us. Um, they all have had uh, the full vaccinations done, so they're happy. Uh, we're getting together because back in November, we lost a very close and dear personal friend of ours uh, to liver cancer. And we really have not had the time to get together as a group, you know, and just kind of share that uh, experience. Um, so I've been looking forward to it, right? But I'm not vaccinated just yet. Uh, and it's been kind of a struggle and it's been frustrating. But the interesting thing is I actually tell you a, a kind of a story is that last Saturday, I actually got uh, the, the, I've been on like so many different sites, um, but I actually was able to get an appointment at Holy Name Hospital last Saturday at one o'clock. And so I was excited and I went down. Um, and <laughs> I was so shocked when I got there, there were police everywhere. And I, I, uh, I had to park about a half a mile away. There must have been 500 cars lined up on both sides of the street. So I walked a half a mile and I get onto this long line. Um, I wait about 40 minutes and then it comes to our attention. We're informed that anybody who is receiving their first vaccination, uh, they're only dispensing the Johnson and Johnson vaccination. They're reserving the Pfizer uh, vaccination for the second time vaxxers. So of course I was pretty upset by that. Uh, my intention was to get either the Pfizer or the Moderna and not the Johnson & Johnson. Um, so I declined and I said I would reschedule. So I am rescheduled for this Saturday at one o'clock again. And we'll see what kind of a circus is going on down there this Saturday. But uh, uh, hopefully things will work out and I'll be able to get my first vaccination. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, again, I, the difference between the two vaccinations, we'll, we'll touch on a little bit. I go into more detail uh, in the, the, the previous webinar that I did, um, but the, the Moderna and the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccinations, which we all know, we've heard of the messenger RNA driven virus uh, vaccinations. Now, what is that? So this is new technology. But it really isn't new technology. People have been nervous about that. They think it's been rushed to the market and they don't know what it's all about. And is it safe? And am I going to be a guinea pig? And the answer is no, 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 no. The technology has really been around for well over a decade. All right. Um, what it is is the delivery system, meaning so the messenger RNA is the instruction sheet. 
right? That's like buying a piece of Ikea furniture and you got to assemble it, but you need the instruction sheet to know how to put the pieces together, right? So without the instruction sheet, you don't know how to actually assemble the furniture that you bought. So it's the same thing with your body making, making antibodies, uh, which are proteins. So in your cells, your DNA is, is manufactures proteins, but it needs an instruction. And so the RNA or the messenger RNA is the instruction uh, given to the DNA to manufacture the proteins. So in the case of this particular vaccination, the messenger RNA is carrying the instructions for your DNA to manufacture the spike proteins that the virus carries. So the spike protein is not the virus. The spike protein, as you see from the pictures, are those spikes that stick out from the virus itself. That is what the virus uses to lock onto your cell's receptors so the virus can enter inside your cells. So the spike protein is not actually the virus, okay? It's its attachment point. And so this vaccination is specific to that spike protein. The principle, the theory behind it is that if we can create an immune response against that protein, that we can inhibit or block the virus from getting inside your cell. That's what it's about, right? So the messenger RNA gives the instruction to the DNA. The messenger RNA does not go into your DNA and genetically mutate your DNA. We have messenger RNAs. They only, they only last a few seconds and then enzymes literally gobble up and destroy it. So they're not getting in and doing any genetic manipulation to your DNA. It's just an instruction code. So what happens is your DNA starts to manufacture these proteins, literally these spike proteins, and when enough of them are assembled, they begin to stick out on the surface of your cell. Now your immune system begins to see those and it looks different, they haven't seen it before. So your immune system uh, rallies and it begins to activate what are called immune B cells. And what they do, B cells, is they manufacture antibodies. So what your immune system is doing is it's producing an immune marker called an antibody specific to that protein. Okay, that is the intention of the vaccination. Um, when enough of those antibodies are manufactured, you have to some degree some built in immunity. Let me back up and maybe re explain this. Yeah, so maybe you're saying this more like immunotherapy. But it is immunotherapy. But the, so Cynthia said it's immunotherapy. Let me just back up. What is the intention of a vaccination in general? Any vaccination. The intention of any vaccination in general is to stimulate your immune system, is to activate your immune system to produce antibodies against something foreign, right? It, you, inherently, without a vaccine, inherently, what is your immune system doing? Your immune system is your defense system, right? It's to defend you against things that are considered foreign to the body, which are known as antigens. They can be environmental chemicals, they can be bacteria or viruses, they can be allergens like pollen. Things that are foreign to the body is known as an antigen. And when your immune system is exposed to that, right, it begins to produce antibodies. So let me back up again, right? In your adaptive immune system, you have two basic systems. You have what is called your Th1 or T helper one system. And your, those are called T cells. And you have your Th2, T helper two, which are called B cells. The T helper one cells, they wanna go around and their job is to take care of, you know, kill off the, the antigen. Um, they have names like cytotoxic chemicals and natural killer cells. So they're going around killing stuff, but they're not really sure. They can't differentiate who's good and who's bad. So the B cells, right? Those are the cells that are manufacturing antibodies, right? The antibody I kind of call like a, like a, uh, like a bullseye. So when you produce an antibody and the antibody sticks to a protein, the Th1 cells see the antibody and that tells them that that's foreign and they wanna go take care of it, right? Now that shouldn't happen in autoimmunity. In autoimmunity, your B cells are making antibodies and it tags your own self tissue, for example, your thyroid. So if you manufacture B cells or antibody, the B cells manufacture antibodies, Okay, against your thyroid, your Th1 sees the, the, the antibodies against your thyroid and says, oh, that form and may attack the thyroid gland. But the nature of your immune system, the Th2 system, okay, creates the antibodies and it tags a protein. So under normal scenarios, if we get infected with a germ, a bacteria, or even a virus um, that we haven't seen before, right, the immune, the Th2 system kicks into gear, 
It starts revving up. It uses energy. So we're tired. We don't want to get out of bed. You may even get a fever because the TH2 system drives inflammation, but it's producing antibodies. And then when enough antibodies are produced and it tags the germ or the virus or the bacteria, right, then the TH1 guys come in and they take care of business. And then when enough of those guys are knocked out, right, then regulating cells say, okay, cool, you did a great job. And the system goes back into balance. And now we move forward and hopefully we have a memory that's at those those antibodies, those IgG antibodies now carry a memory of that foreign antigen. So that if we get infected again in the future, the TH1 guys are right on the scene and take care of business. And that is the inherent principle behind a vaccination is to stimulate these B cells, okay? Give you the, they're giving you the vaccine. They're giving you some, in, in the old vaccines, they're trying to give you maybe fragments of the virus, attenuated viruses and things. Uh, so that your immune system would recognize that. You know, basically it comes out of homeopathy. Homeopathy, I mean, homeopathy, <laughs> vaccination is really birthed out of homeopathy. Homeopathy is like begets like, right? It was to give you the infection, a little bit of it, in order for your immune system to recognize and strengthen itself against it, right? In homeopathy, what they do, for example, if they wanted to give you, uh, a, you know, immune, uh, uh, resiliency against a snake bite, a snake venom. Well, they would give you small traces of the snake venom. What they actually do in homeopathy is they keep diluting the venom down and diluting it down and diluting it down, almost to the point that the, the venom itself is not even there, but the energy imprint is there. And so you're still getting the energy imprint of the, of the toxin without actually getting the toxin, but your immune system still creates the same reaction. So you build immune resiliency against the snake venom. So vaccines kind of birthed out of that concept. Well, let's give you the virus and get your immune system to react to it. The unfortunate part in the, what we might call the standard vaccinations, right? Is they put all kinds of fragments of the virus in there, whether they were dead viruses or particles of live viruses and stuff. But they also put in there a tremendous amount of preservatives. That's what everybody's concerned about, right? Like mercury and aluminums and other things. And it was always like, well, how are these viruses even being cultivated in a laboratory, right? Well, they're being produced on Petri dishes. And these Petri dishes are really, unfortunately, they are made from things like chick embryos and other things that just most people wouldn't want in them, right? And so that's part of the downside of those old style of vaccinations that you were getting all these unwanted things injected into your cardiovascular system. And who knows what the side effects would, that, would be from that, right? Which is why I've always been against, you know, routine daily, uh, you know, yearly kinds of vaccinations for flu vaccinations and stuff. This, this situation is different. And this, these Moderna vaccines, these messenger RNA vaccinations is new technology. It is a new frontier. Let me explain. The frontier is almost like liposomal. So in our office, anybody who's been there knows that a lot of the supplements that we use are in what is called a liposomal delivery. We have the antioxidant glutathione in liposomal form. We have vitamin C in liposomal forms. We have vitamin D in liposomal forms. What does that mean? A liposome is a fat. It's the same fat that the membrane of your cells are made up of. That's kind of cool, right? So, you're so they encase I'll use glutathione as an example. The, 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 the technology is allowed, can take the glutathione, which is incredibly important. And it's important because glutathione needs to be inside of your cells. That's where it does its job, all right? And getting inside your cells has always been historically extremely difficult. You know, when you ever take any kind of a supplement, right? The point is you gotta get it inside your cell. So uh, with the new technology, they can envelop the glutathione in a liposome in this fat, which again is the same fat your cells are made up of. You're putting it under your tongue, okay, sublingually. What does that mean? It means it goes through your mucous membrane of your mouth and it goes directly into circulation, right? So it's bypassing your gut, it's bypassing your liver. There's no breaking down, it goes right into circulation. And the liposome then blends in, it just blends into the cell's wall because it's the same substance and it's able to transport the glutathione directly inside of your cell. That's the powerful effect of liposomal delivery. So you can take a lower dosage and get a higher impact in taking a liposomal delivery. So this technology with the virus is basically the same thing, right? The, the, they're, they're surrounding basically the carrier of this is to carry it in a sort of like a nanoparticle liposomal form so that it's carrying the information 
It's carrying the messenger RNA and is delivering it directly inside of your cells so that your DNA gets the instructions to make the proteins. And when the proteins are made, the spike proteins are made, right? You produce the antibodies against the spike proteins. That's what we want. Okay, what about side effects? Concern about side effects. And I've even had people, right, who have been vaccinated um, and they're reporting that they don't feel so good and is it bad? Did they get the virus and so forth? No, you are not getting the virus in the, in the Pfizer Moderna version. You are not getting the virus. You're getting information to make proteins, not the virus. However, right, what you're doing is you're turning on in, with intention is you're activating the Th2 called the B cell system to make antibodies. And the very nature of activating that does create to some degree, inflammation. I mean, that's in part what your immune system does. And so very often when a person doesn't feel good, if they get a mild temperature increase, they feel a little bit of malaise after the vaccination, that is not bad. That is not an indication that you got the infection. It's an indication in, in kind of a good way that your immune system is responding favorably, right? And it's turning on and it's starting to create the antibodies, exactly what you want to have happen. Now, what you don't want is to feel that way for, you know, if it's a, a week goes by, 10 days goes by or longer, and you're still complaining, or your symptoms are getting progressively worse, that is unwanted, right? Because that means that the immune system is not turning off, right? But that's something that we see day in and day out in our office, forget about the virus. That's just what so many people are dealing with is an imbalanced immune system to begin with, where they're just in a chronic state of ongoing, what we call chronic low-grade inflammation, meaning that the immune system is not calming down, right? That is the biggest you know, driver of it is. You know, the more I'm in this world, the more that I study, I'm um, in webinars and programs constantly. And I've been saying it, and I am getting proof of this every day that I continue in my, my learning studies here, that everything uh, it, it is connected to your immune system. All chronic degenerative diseases of any way, shape, or form, uh, is connected back to the immune system and to the dysregulation of the immune system. And that's why really our campaign, what I've always been campaigning on my office besides this COVID thing, is how do we build immune resiliency, right? I mean, that's really what it comes down to because even after the vaccine, right? And so Cynthia's making a point here, which is, uh, you know, what about the variant? Is, there, is the vaccine gonna be any good if there's a variant and so on and so forth? Well, see, this is the reason why you're hearing scientists really trying to encourage people to get vaccinated more quickly than pushing things off is because the more that we build immune resiliency through the vaccination, the more people that are vaccinated, right? Then the less there's gonna be a variation, okay? The more people you turn from this uh, and, and don't wanna do it, there's more opportunity for the viruses to, 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 to vary. Most of the variation takes place in the spike proteins, okay? The, the tool that the virus uses in order to get inside the cell. Right, and so that's why again, the more people that get back, the sooner more people get vaccinated, the more you're going to control the variations. The variations that do exist, it seems so far that for the majority of people that have been vaccinated, their immune system is still identifying for the most part the uh, the variation and still having pretty good Im immunological response. Okay, so hope I covered that pretty well. Um, but you know, the other thing I would still probably just kind of speak about here too, besides the vaccine right, is um, if you get the vaccine, does that itself make you a superhero, okay? <laughs> Meaning, <laughs> no, because, you know, just because you get the vaccine does not mean that you now have immune resiliency to slow down cardiovascular disease, or to slow down dementia, so forth, right? Um, meaning, my, I'm, I'm saying to you is that anybody who's listening is that there's always going to be more variants, there's going to be more viruses, there's going to be more challenges. If there's one thing, in my opinion, that this experience, this viral experience we're having is really, you know, pointing a figure out is our healthcare system, right? Is again, unfortunately, I was having actually a conversation yesterday with a practitioner from Canada who reached out to me. Um, and bottom line was, you were talking about it, it's that, it's same there too. It's that, it, that, you know, we have a system that is really, it's a sick care system. Obviously you've heard me say that. 
And you all honestly know that it's a sick care system, right? Uh, everything about our health, it's not a healthcare system. It's a system that is driven monetarily on people being sick, not on people being well, right? And so, and therefore is the reason why you're seeing such devastation when you have a pandemic, because what are the, co what are the comorbidity factors? Obesity, diabetes, right? Cardiovascular disease, hypertension, that is literally half the population of people, if not more than half the population of people, right? So, I mean, half the population of people are, 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 are morbid, morbidly inflamed, right? Which is why if they get the infection, their immune system is already out of control and their, their regulating system can't control the immunological response, right? So the point I'm getting at for anyone who's listening here is great, you know, get the vaccination, but, you know, take, start to try to get, be more proactive in your health, right? I mean, um, you know, the daily things we do in our lives from our lifestyle behaviors, from sleep to the food choices we make, to exercise, to relationships, to our attitudes, to stress reduction. I know that sounds like it's always oh, easy for you to say that, Dr. Putin, it's hard to do that. And I get it. I live in the same world under the same stress as everyone else does, right? But you have to prioritize it. If it, you know, you have to just create enough meaning that you prioritize these things in your life. You prioritize your diet, right? You prioritize exercise. You prioritize like you prioritize other things. You have to make it equally important. And the more that you and you start doing these things step by step, I mean, you start to start feeling more energetic, more resilient, stronger. Uh, you, you, there's a momentum, and you start getting more encouraged by it, and you want to keep building on that. Okay. In the direction of, um, you know, underlying signs of things like kidney disease, or move in the direction of um, uh, uh, kidney disease, not the actual clot. Liver and kidney disease. Well, so we still get a lot of people, or, or what you would look for in a blood test as inflammatory markers, right? So we see these two things. We see, we see a lot okay. of Cynthia, yeah, so she's saying that what she's, Cynthia is saying is, is uh, she's talking about liver and kidney disease, but she's really kind of suggesting or trying to point out is like, what are some of the markers that we see that in, indicates inflammation? Yet yeah, this word inflammation uh, e e eludes people, um, meaning that, you know, people are familiar with a sprained ankle and seeing it get swollen and get hot and uncomfortable and painful. And so we go home and we elevate and we pack it on ice. And what do we take? We take an anti-inflammatory, right? To make us feel better. Um, so there's a huge distinction, but what we call, the term is really called silent inflammation. Like if cardiovascular disease, as a simple example, um, is a disease of, of inflammation. It's silent inflammation. You can't actually feel it happening. You begin to see signs as your blood pressure goes up right? As the arteries start to coagulate, you know, or you, you're, you're getting signs like, uh, I, I can't breathe really well because you, you know, your, your blood vessels can't get oxygen to tissues, which are late stages, right? If you talk to neurologists, anybody in the science world will tell you that dementia and Alzheimer's disease, as an example, is what is it? It's inflammation in your brain. This is like, I know we're running out of time here, but this is a really, I'll leave you something really fascinating, right? Which is this. Uh, See, so your brain does not have pain receptors, which means you can't feel pain in your, in your brain. People say, what about a headache? That's not in the brain. It's blood vessels going to the brain, right? But the, the, the brain itself, right, does not have pain receptors. So you cannot feel pain. So you can't tell when there's actual inflammation, like a swollen ankle giving you pain. You can't tell when there's inflammation in your brain because you don't feel the pain. But what you begin to see are signs and symptoms of the damage that's accumulating because of the chronic unresolved inflammation. And that can start with everything from brain fog to mood disorders, to anxiety and depression, to memory problems, right? So all of these things are signs of inflammation in the brain, even though you don't actually feel the pain. Same thing in the cardiovascular system. So when you look at a blood test, as a beginning stage, you know, there's a lot of markers there, right? So one marker, for example, is called CRP or C-reactive protein. Protein made in your liver 
but it's reacting to underlying inflammation in the body or underlying immune response to something in the body. And so as that C-reactor protein goes up, it is a marker that cardiologists use specifically to inflammation of the cardiovascular system, but it is, an, it is a marker of inflammation systemically throughout the body, right? Again, made in your liver as a response of your immune system reacting to either viruses or bacteria or heavy metals or something that's going on there, right? And there's a lot of other markers like homocysteine and you can look at uh, liver enzymes. But again, um, that's one of the reasons why we look at a blood test is to kind of look at markers and get an understanding of something. You know, if a uh, liver enzymes are elevated, right, in a blood test, what does that mean? It means your liver is inflamed and it's dumping these enzymes, okay, that are dying off quickly into the blood system. It doesn't tell us why it's happening. It's just an indication of inflammation, okay? So I hope I didn't get too heavy there. No? Is there anything else, any questions? Anything else you wanna just chit chat about? Um, so these are saying, there's another question is like, what are signs and symptoms? What are signs of prolonged inflammatory response? Well, I think I just kind of answered that a little bit. Um, for, I mean, I think a really common example I always give to people is let's say blood pressure, right? If you have high blood pressure, I always tell people, you know, you go to the medical doctor and what they do is put you on blood pressure medication, right? It will work. You'll get the pressure down and that should be the case. Um, but if you ask your doctor, when do I get off the blood pressure medication? What's the answer? Never. Right? Why? Because if you stop the blood pressure medication, what's going to happen? The blood pressure is going to go right back up because the medication is not addressing the underlying root cause. As root cause, the underlying root cause of your blood pressure problem. So the, the condition, the causation is still there. It's still percolating. Right? And what does that mean? It means your body is going to give you something else. So also months later, whatever, six months later, you get a new condition. Let's say it's headaches and you're seeing a different doctor and being treated with medications for that. But the underlying root causes are connected. They're never being addressed, right? So when you're looking at root causes, you know, what is the root cause? So signs and symptoms of blood pressure, anything that's unresolved are indications of ongoing inflammation in the body, right? Um, so anyway, what do we want to talk about, Seth? There's some questions. Yeah. You know, pull up our, we have a book, we have a whole booklet on immune health. Yeah, I mean, if anybody is actually looking, you know, kind of in, as we go along with these things that are getting kind of interested about what we do and you want to dig a little bit deeper, um, if you have some pressing questions about your own personal health issues, you know, obviously what you can do is go to our website. We offer a free discovery call, uh, see if we can give you some answers and some suggestions and some guidance. Um, or even see if, you know, perhaps what we do is the right fit for you and whether we can partner with you in your health journey. Uh, and your health concerns. So, okay, all good for today. Hope this is helpful. And I look forward to our Root Cause radio show next Thursday. Everybody, bye-bye.